Okay, welcome back to Playoff Leafs fans in hostile lands. We're so excited that it is playoff time. The hockey is so much more fun and means so much. We've been waiting for this. I've been so excited. It's been the best. Leafs are up 2 nothing in the se- Ah, shit. It is 1-1 one, one in the series. That was the other pre-recorded. Yeah. 1-1 one, one in the series at this point. Uh, hopefully you're listening before the game on Friday or just after the game on Friday. And it's looking like it's probably going to be 2-1 for a yep. team in blue and white. You never know. It, it will be. Unless someone wears black, like we've been saying. You know, you know, ah. Are they allowed to wear alternate jerseys in the playoffs? I don't think so. Why would they? Yeah, Edmonton was wearing their dark blues in the first game. I think that's their main one. I think the orange is the alternate now. I don't think so. I think the orange is still their main. Okay. Unless they change that this year, in which case that's an ugly main jersey. It's so ugly. (laughs) It's so bad. So bad. The orange isn't great, but I like it more than the blue. I'd say it's more iconic and more catchy, and everyone in the crowd is wearing orange. That is true. What other team is orange? The Ducks. You don't count. You did that late. Yeah, who cares? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're also not in the playoffs. Go away. Okay. Leafs games. We're going to make this a uh, quick podcast so you can listen to it quickly. Game one. Man, they came out firing. They really, really did. And you know who else did? Kyle Clifford. Mm. Shift one. Bye-bye. And yeah. that's, that's how his first two games went. Uh, I kind of found it surprising, personally, that, well, I, I don't find it surprising he got a penalty, but I find it right. surprising it was a relatively quick game misconduct, and I was surprised about the suspension, because I kind of agree with Dangle on this, that the game one was kind of the suspension, like it was five minutes into the game, he missed the rest of it, that's, that's almost an entire game suspension, but I guess they wanted to do a little bit more for this. Talking about the game misconduct first, and it was, again, early in the game. Do you guys think this set the tone for what is acceptable physically? Dan, start us off. I think they tried to set the tone. I mean, I was really surprised to see it as a game misconduct as well. I, You know, you don't want to hit the numbers, and you don't want to hit from behind, and it's not... It usually ends up in somebody getting hurt, but he didn't get hurt. He didn't even get a bruise on him. There was no blood. But I think, you know, the rest were really trying to, as you said, Kyle, set a tone for the playoffs and what they're expecting. They're expecting this is going to be a physical, almost violent uh, matchup between Tampa and Toronto. And so I think they thought, okay, we have an opportunity started early. Um, but I, I was disappointed also to see the suspension. I don't think that was warranted. Craig, anything to add about setting the tone? I th- I think, if anything, the... Well, the game, the misconduct was setting the tone for the game, saying, you know, you guys can play heavy, but don't let it get out of hand. But I think the suspension was, again, more to set the tone for the playoffs. The Leafs being in the biggest the market, the, the biggest market, they get the most media attention. Uh, and a guy like Kyle Clifford, they know they suspend him for a game. He was probably going to sit for game two anyways. He's a fringe player. Do that, show the rest of the league that, you know, these other guys who may be more valuable to their teams, you can't get away with that. As long as they stay with that standard for the rest of the playoffs. Unfortunately, I think Clifford just had to be the sacrificial lamb for the rest of the league to show the, you know, they're going to take this series silly over the playoffs. And based on the rest of the game and game two, did anybody take it seriously? Uh, no. no, it's the NHL. Why would you take them seriously? Yeah, yeah. Uh. Would this have been called the same in previous seasons, do you think? Do you think it would still be a game misconduct? Do you think there may have been a suspension after the fact, or both still? Or, oh, that's a good uh, playoff hit. Rough hockey, playoff hockey. Let's go. Keep the whistles away, refs. Craig, what do you think? Uh, Regular season or playoffs? Playoffs. Like game one, playoffs, same thing. No. Well, it would have been a a five-minute major, probably nothing else. Like, it was kind of just a grazing, unnecessary hit from behind. Like, it wasn't coming straight in at him. He wasn't head down, anything like that. It was just an unnecessary play. A five-minute major, absolutely. The game is conduct, sure, I understand. But the extra game, you're not going to... I don't think they would have called that in most other seasons. You agree, Dan? Yeah, no, I agree completely. I mean, the league is cracking down on this kind of play, and they would like to see a little bit cleaner play, or at least people not being in positions where they could get hurt. But I, I, 
last playoff round uh, against Montreal as a kind of bench line, uh, benchmark, they let anything go then. Like they had, there were a couple big hits, sure, that didn't go uncalled. Um, but it was just almost a free for all. So I think they were definitely, as Craig said, setting a tone for this series specifically with the misconduct. I, I thought the misconduct was surprising, but at the start of the game, maybe they wanted to get it in early. Uh, but yeah, no, it was uh, disappointing to see, and I don't think it would have happened in previous years like that. Speaking of that Habs series, I know Craig has mentioned many times that Ben Surratt, the cross-checking in front of the net machine, really, really loved that cross-check, and wow, were there a lot of cross-checking penalties called, at least in that first game. Again, do you think the refs are sending a message, these playoffs are going to be different, we're not going to be putting the whistles away? And did the teams adjust either throughout game one or in game two? Dan, start us off. Cross-checking. Well, I mean, cross-checking, like, I saw a whole lot of cross-checking that I I was actually surprised. They called more of it than I thought. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was the in front of the net. I can't remember who it was now, Um, but I think it was on Blackwell or Brody, maybe, uh, which was called to my surprise because I, you know, that kind of thing they let go early but when it's so far removed from the play i think they're kind of using that as a benchmark as like if you're really close to the play they're kind of gonna let it go a little bit more but then if you're further away from the play right now um they're really sending a message there i think they're going to do the same thing that they've done all season long beginning of the season they said this is the year we're going to crack down on cross checks you know we're not it's gonna not gonna be accept, uh, acceptable anymore that happened for about 10 games and then for the next 72 <laughs> it was just cross checks galore i think we'll see the same thing over the first three four games we'll get those calls but i think for the rest of the playoffs it's just gonna be free for all and cross checks again i mean that's okay so you think it was just first game and never mind we we tried something and it's not playoff hockey it's not what the the traditionalists want ref put the whistle away you're saying that correct? by game three or four in in the series of any of the series Whistles are going to start going away because people are going to want to see, you know, they're, they're going to get tired of power plays and power play game. They want to see the guys at five on five. And that's what playoff hockey is. And unfortunately, well, that's what the refs in the NHL seem to think what playoff hockey is. I love what the last two games have been. Yep. I, I, if it's a penalty, call it all the time. I don't care if it's for or against. Leafs got a lot of penalties, so a lot of stupid penalties. We took them. But I'd rather see that happen. Um, then, then put the whistles away and have playoff style hockey. Like you mean, call the rule book? Like what? No. Wait, what's that? Game one, I was sitting beside Dan. I looked over at him. I'm like, this is what we've been asking for all season. Call the rule book. Yep. Yep. That's what we asked for all year in the playoffs last year. Maybe they'll bring it back a bit for game seven because they'll get a lot of flack if they don't. Yeah. (laughs) And Craig is a non-believer that this will continue. Let us know. Do you do you think that the refs are going to keep the whistles going, or more is going to go back to normal playoff style, which I think plays more to Tampa's strengths as one of the best, if not the best, playoff performers in the past decade, probably. And they've really, really learned how to play playoff hockey. For the Leafs, while they have been extremely physical in this series, they're not taking any shit. They are trying to live up to a playoff potential. Power play and even penalty kill is working in the Leafs' advantage. They have that offensive power to do it, number one power play in the league, and the most shorthanded goals in the league. So, this is playing to their strength. I hope it stays. I hope it stays, and we can keep this this power play, penalty kill sort of stuff happening. Now, the penalty kill, shorthanded goals... Those are going to become less likely. Wow, there were a lot of chances in that first game. It was like every single power play Tampa took, at least were going two on one the other way. And then it was one on none. I think there was even three on one. They only got, I think, one shorthanded goal on Kampf's crazy, awesome shot. But they also got another one in game two. Like they didn't, you know, back down. They were still, uh, still doing this. So let's stick on the power play and the penalty kill for a second. Dan, what's standing out to you? Well, you know, just when you were talking there, I, I was thinking about the second game, and Tampa was getting a lot more aggressive on their penalty kill as well. That kind of stood out like, okay, they're they're realizing the way the Leafs play, their power play, 
And really, I, I think the Leafs had a good power play in the second game, the first two that they had, which were scoreless. Mm -hmm. But Tampa figured them out. They kept them outside. They kept them not having the shots uh, right in front of the net. And they gave Vassy a really, really good chance at stopping anything and kept everybody out from in front. So I, I'm a little bit worried that Tampa is uh, very quickly figured out kind of the Leafs' really good power play. Um, and if they're figuring that out, and then they're also going to figure out that our PK is super aggressive and they need to shut that down. Um, you know, I, I'm a little less. Uh, optimistic about the special teams. Having said that, though, the Leafs play extremely well five on five, and we get a ton of points based on five on five. So, either way, I'm feeling okay. But Tampa figuring it out us out so quickly scares me. And it didn't seem like we figured them out too much between game one and game two. It was more the Leafs came out firing, and it was awesome for the Leafs. And the Lightning made adjustments, and the Leafs didn't. And and they they happened to just take more penalties as well, kind of made more mistakes in Tampa, capitalized on stuff like that. Sticking with the special teams, Craig, what's sticking out to you to the most? Uh, penalty kill, power play, stuff like that within two games. Well, obviously, we need to limit the penalties that we take because that is such a strength for Tampa. So I've got a funny little stat I saw earlier. Well, I just kind of saw as I skip flipping through the box score. Who had the lowest plus minus in last night's game? Like in the yes. negatives, you mean? Justin Hall. <laughs> 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 he wasn't even on the ice. <laughs> I, I'm thinking it's going to be like Riley. It was Steven Stamkos. It was a, really? Oh, we're looking at both teams. It was a teams. minus oh, two. Well, they won 5-3. <laughs> There was so much, so many of their goals came on the special. They had three power play goals. So if you take out the power play goals, it was a tie game. Or, yeah, because Toronto scored one of the power so Oh, yeah, because one was shorthanded. It wasn't on the power play. Yeah. 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 If the Leafs can just stay out of the box, like, they took some stupid penalties. They can take away one of the biggest assets that Tampa has is their power play. Yes, Toronto shorthanded has been really good, but obviously it's not good enough. And Simmons did address that today in his uh, media availability where he said, I made mistakes. I, I admit I made mistakes. It led to some goals. I feel bad about it. We're going to focus on the next game. So, you know, they know what they did wrong. They need to correct it, though, as you said, Craig, and keep it up, keep out of the box. Do you think Simmons loses his spot based on his play in game two? I, I wouldn't move him yet. I think uh, keep the momentum he has. He's still aggressive, and he, he's, a playing, he's playing aggressively against Tampa, which is good. I think we need that physicality. Uh, but, you know, if we don't see either some kind of production from him or really good play around the ice or he takes more penalties, then yeah, yeah I'd, he'd be the first to go. See, Craig, you think Simmons is in game See, I wouldn't be surprised if they got uh, Clifford back in. Now that we've got Bunting back in the lineup, it just shift everyone back down. Now that he's back from mm -hmm. his suspension, maybe you do sit Simmons because as we noticed throughout the season, that he seems to do the best when he's got rest. I think it's just a lot. I think maybe that's he, we're asking a lot of him in that game with only having him in and being in the playoffs and already being in game two. I think give him game three off, get Clifford back in there. I like the third line or the fourth line generally beyond that, but I think Simmons had no jump to his game. He was always one step behind and then doing something stupid. And I think it just clears the air a little bit. Because it seems like there's there's a bit of a bone between Maroon and Simmons yeah. and a couple other players on Tampa and Simmons. If Simmons isn't in the lineup, they they don't really have their guy to well, go for They might go for anymore. Clifford. Who's their they target? They might go for Clifford now that, uh, because he had that board. Yeah, that's true. They didn't really get, they didn't get their sure. turn to flesh because he got his game misconduct. But it, that was five days ago now. Yeah, they, they've got, lo they've got Whoa, long memories. They don't forget. Look at, okay, look at okay, Tampa okay. and uh, Columbus Blue Jackets and look at their rivalry. That's a long memory. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Okay. To be okay, fair. Maybe bad take there. <laughs> to be fair, at this point, I'm a little bit more worried about Campbell. Um, they seem to be playing really aggressively around Campbell. And even, um, I, I want to even say it was Maroon, but I'm not sure. Um, kind of boarding one of our D, I can't remember who, into Campbell. And then, uh, or hitting him into Campbell. 
you know, hoping for the, oh, Campbell looks like he pulled a muscle kind of thing. That's kind of freaking me out. Seems to be a little common around the playoffs right now with Carolina and even Pittsburgh going down a couple goalies. And, uh, but they, but they don't have a Shulgren. Uh, uh, we've got a Shulgren. Whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means. Um, yeah, I think you nailed it on the head, Craig. we got to stay out of the box for game three. And it's it's tough because I'm finding that the Leafs really, really want to be that physical team. They are always said to be the offensive team, and they don't have that playoff grit, and they're never going to get over the hump because they don't have that playoff grit and blah, blah, blah. And they're really, really trying to have that this year. And I'd say they like do Riley. have it. I think they're maybe just overcompensating a bit. Riley and Riley has is, really yeah. stepped up his game in terms of his aggressiveness in the playoffs. And... He's shown that he can be a leader on this team, and that might just be the way that he's going to have to lead in the playoffs. I agree. I just think they maybe went too far yes. in game two. Maybe even in game one. First off with a Clifford hit, and then with the line brawl with uh, Riley throwing maybe one too many punches, not only injuring Ruda, or at least a little gas to the head, but also his own hand. Like he was icing his hand, which is not great. I'm sure he can there. play through it, but not not great. You don't want to be handicapping yourself in any way especially when it's not really needed in that uh situation like the that that's line brawl stuff was so weird i was watching the steve dangle broadcast so i didn't get to see mm-hmm. half of it until it came back on but i remember the beginning of it where first cory perry and then pat maroon were trying to go with simmons and simmons didn't care he's like we're up five nothing i've got nothing to do with you go away i'm not going to give you momentum and then commercial and come back and poof, it all blew up, which maybe Riley. Yeah, I, I, it does look like Riley was kind of the aggressor during that line brawl. Like he's the one that kind of went back into the pile and kind of started. I don't know what happened. I don't know what was said. But uh, then Maroon grabs him, feeds him a couple times. Then Riley turns around and gives Ruda a couple. And it, it, it seemed really unnecessary because it was so far after the play and, you know, Obviously, the refs need to do a better job in that kind of situation to dispel that kind of stuff. Because if they don't want the after the play, you know, shenanigans, they need to be clearing the guys out to get back to the bench. Just they have that ability, but they just kind of let it happen. Okay, let's move on to the offense a little bit here because our boys showed up. They were dead last year in the playoffs against the Habs. Really, really shut down by Philip Deneau, who's actually doing a wonderful job against Edmonton. I didn't think L.A. would even have a shot, but they really have to contend with Philip Deneau and Andre Kopitar right Less now. Less so last night, but... But... True, true, true. But I, I don't expect they'll back down in the next couple games. <laughs> uh, Matthews and Marner showing up on the score sheet, and it is some really cool hockey watching them play and really putting forward their best playoff foot and... Really, they haven't lost a step since the regular season. It's just continued on. There hasn't been... Obviously, they they feel the pressure, but they just look like themselves out this out there this year. And it's it's a nice sigh of relief for us. It makes you want to cheer even harder. Matthew's making some of the best defensive plays, being aggressive with his body, which is awesome. I think the uh, bunting goal was was basically because Matthews was so aggressive in the corner there, totally. but not so aggressive that he called that you know he he got a penalty. So some really really smart play by those guys and putting it up on the score sheet, and then obviously Marner with his awesome PK play. This is great. I think the the most recent uh, thing to talk about for that is the almost Leafs comeback in uh, game two. Now I say almost with a grain of salt, but <laughs> it was five one. They could have said, you know what? Okay, we're done. We're just going to rest our big guys. Third and fourth line, you get out there. No, it was, why not? Let's go for it. We can do this. They get one. They get two. They go six on four. Let's see if, let's see if we can do it. It's, it's all or nothing. If we can get up to uh, nothing, that'd be, that'd be awesome. Dan, what did you see in this potential comeback, maybe referencing uh, Matthews or Marner or, or just a team? Well, I mean, I... So the Leafs only had a period and a half, in my opinion, maybe a period and a smidge more, um, of really not great play. Uh, the first period, they were solidly playing. I thought, okay, we're, we almost got out of the first period. I think they, yeah, Tampa scored right at the end of the first. So we got out of the first period 
relatively unscathed. We played well. Shots were going well. And then we slumped. Uh, Hedman gets a goal, and everything just kind of cascades after that. So that was unfortunate. But as you were talking about the comeback, I was really impressed to see. We've been talking all year about how the ability in the playoffs is really to come back from a loss or come back from being in a deficit. And they showed that they could. And they showed that they were still motivated to do it. And one of the differences I, I've seen this year in the playoffs from last year is, A, they're having fun. Uh, Matthews and Marner especially are having a good time together. Um, the team is clicking, and people know how they're, how they're playing with the lines, even with bunting back. That was really nice. I think that the power play with the Tampa's power play, goals were really unfortunate. And as we said, if those hadn't happened, it would have been a much different story. But the last 12 minutes for the Leafs, I think they dominated the play more than not. Um, they were playing really well. Marner's showing incredible patience with the puck when he's shooting right now. He's really waiting for that mm. spot, and I think that's why he got points in both games. Uh, so if we can continue to play like that, yeah, we'll get down. And I think it was a bit of whiplash. Like, we win 5 nothing, and then, oh my god, they're up four something goals before we score and or something like that and it was just ridiculous so they got back on their feet and i think we're going to see more of that just before i go to craig with marner's patience i agree he's being patient but not too patient sometimes the leafs are way too patient they try to get that perfect shot that perfect play pass 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 and then nothing comes of it he's just patient enough and then finds his opportunity and it's so cool to see him score in this craig maybe not referencing the comeback specifically but matthews marner maybe even nylander what are we what are we seeing i want to talk about the comeback i think (laughs) okay (laughs) well i'll I'll start with that i think what they were really get what they really got out of the end of the game maybe they weren't they knew they wouldn't be able to necessarily mount a full comeback but it's momentum they got momentum at the end of the game showing that they're not out of it. Tampa doesn't just own the series from this point forward by taking over the play for even the last 10, 15 minutes. They were getting ready for the next game. They were getting there, you know, getting back in the rhythm, showing, working on the things that they need to work on against Tampa. But yeah, it's, it's great to see that Matthews Marner are contributing. They're scoring. Nylander has been a threat. He's looked really good on that third line. I didn't notice John Tavares at all last night. I'm going to talk about that. I was going to bring him up next. Yeah, go for it. I know John Tavares brings the little things. Defensively, he's going to, he's not a liability. I think maybe we need to shuffle some lines and get him some different line mates because I'm not sure whoever he's playing with right now is working for him. And the funny part is, whoever he's playing with is... I can't even think of it right now. It's Mikheyev and... It's... It's Kerf- Kerfoot sometimes, Mikheyev sometimes, Kerfoot primarily. sometimes, yeah. Kasha sometimes, Nylander sometimes. They're giving Nylander a lot of minutes, which was interesting because he had food poisoning after that first game or yeah, before that, that first game. That's wild after finding that out. But I totally agree. Tavares doesn't, I wouldn't say he doesn't look great, but you're right. He's, he's invisible. Uh, Dan Tavares? Uh, yeah, no, I agree. We didn't really see much out of Tavares. In fact, just looking at his stats here. Yeah, uh, didn't really contribute much. He got an assist in the first game, and that's great. But we're going to need to see more out of the captain, certainly. And we can't rely on our first line or our our uh, special teams to take us all the way. It's got to be four lines. Exactly. Got to go for it. Exactly. Are either of you guys worried about Tavares? Or it's just like, okay, he's got this. He's got this. I think he's a calming presence for the team. Generally, he's... Mm-hmm. He can get into, you know, get into the scrum, kind of get into the confrontations when he needs to. But I think generally he's just a a good calming presence on that bench. As long as he's not a liability, he's go- he's still good on the power play. He still is good at moving the puck around. And our third line is so good right now with the Engvall, Kampf, and Nylander that they can play more second line minutes, kind of a, a 2B along with the 2A. We can spread those minutes along pretty well so we're not relying too much on that second line but as long as they can keep the puck in the zone so we can get that first line out there they're kind of doing their job as long as Marner Matthews can keep scoring I'm not worried until face-offs drop off 
right now we're seeing some really good face-off production from him, and I think that's really, really key with this Tampa team. Is Especially for possession. power plays. So, when, he, when he's on there with those guys, plays, to be able yeah. to get that possession right at the beginning, Leafs are, their power play has been really good. It, they've been able to keep the puck as long as they've gotten into the zone. Uh, Tampa yep. doesn't have the best penalty kill in the league. And Toronto, if they can get more penalties or more power plays than they do penalties, they can at least stay in this series. But if they keep going into the box, that's where they're going to find the trouble going forward. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I mean, five shots over two games, that's a little below his average. But again, we're probably playing a little bit more heavy on the first lines right now. Okay, JT, it's time. It's time, buddy. Show, show, your, show your stuff. I hope he's not a little gun shy based on last year, especially with Corey Perry on the ice. Doesn't seem like the type, but you never know. It's playoff hockey. It is a little bit more potentially dangerous out there. And he obviously doesn't want to go through what he went through last year. Who would? And, and we don't want that to happen either. So keep your head up, Tavares. Keep your head up. You got this, buddy. I know you're listening. <laughs> right. I'm not worried. What else do they have to do tonight? I'm not worried about Tavares <laughs> yet. I'll worry after game three if he hasn't, doesn't he have to score? He doesn't, as long as he makes himself noticeable. Yeah, exactly. Noticeable. Yeah. 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 Okay. Speaking of game three, great segue, Craig. Well done. What adjustments need to be made for game three? Now, I'll throw out the obvious one we've talked about. Stay out of the box. That does not mean stop being physical. Maybe just back it off a bit or be physical in a smart way. Break the rules smartly or cheat smartly. So stay out of the box. Boom. Done. Like, if they're going to take a penalty to stop a goal, fine. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes that's going to happen. Not all the penalties the Leafs took were stupid, but enough of them were that that's what they need to cut into yeah. the game. I agree. I agree. They've also so got a lot of penalties they- drawn on them, which is, mm-hmm. you know, for two games, Tampa's good at that. So they're going to have to watch for that too. Sarka. Okay, so what adjustments do you think need to be made? Uh, I don't think any adjustments need to happen in goal. Jack Campbell's been pretty solid overall. I wouldn't hang many of these goals on him. What adjustments need to happen offensively? And what adjustments potentially need to happen defensively? Uh, Dan, start us off. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say too much right now. I don't feel bad after that loss. I, I think the Leafs should have gotten the moment. Like, okay, if I want to see something big change i would say uh shake it off a little bit faster you know they got down really quickly in goals against and shake that off you're in the playoffs you really have to produce we saw it in the first period of that second game we saw it in the last period of the second game so we know that they can do it and the the leafs have you know they used to be a really good first period team in the start of the season now they're a really good second half of the game and so as long as we can keep that going i think we're fine so i'm not worried about offensive production um defense i i did see one one play last night where i think it was the brody line where it was literally like a wave of five guys going at the tampa net and we weren't really behind by that much at that point so like maybe hang back a little bit um but tampa didn't get too many breakouts except for on the penalty kill which was a little frustrating yeah the leafs are best when they've got two guys back when there's two men back and they're not pinching and they're just maintaining pressure maintaining puck possession that's when they're good Yep. It's when you get one or two of the defensemen pinching in, no one covering them. That's when you get a lot of trouble. But I think the Leafs are so good at maintaining puck possession that if it's coming out of the zone, have a guy, have that second guy back, keep the puck possession, and just get it going back again. They try to sometimes they seem to slip into the old Leafs of a couple of years ago, where it's more that run and gun, trying to force it, than just let the game come to you. But they'd have allowed a fair amount of odd man rushes. But when they're at their best throughout the season is when they've got two guys back and they're playing more of a defensive style game than a just trying to force it to the net, trying to keep the puck in kind of game. And just on that, Craig, um, you were saying that they need to kind of change the momentum of the game when they slowed it down at the end of the second period. Uh, kind of leading in the third and got their game back. That's when I really started noticing things changing. They just they looked scrambly in that second period. They were reacting. They weren't thinking. 
They slowed it down, played a lot better. The game I think of that I think was possibly the Leafs' best game in my mind this season was when they played Nashville. I think they only got 18 shots, but they limited Nashville to the outside the entire game, and they played a good structured game, and they capitalized on chances when they could. Sometimes you need to play that kind of game. Just shut it down, slow it down, and get your opportunities. But when they try to force the play forward, try to push it, that's when Tampa's going to make you, make you look like a fool. Because it is a puck, it is a bouncing piece of rubber on ice. Sometimes it'll just bounce in the wrong direction. And if you are pinching forward and trying to force the play, the puck's going back your, in the other direction toward your goalie. So, Craig, do you think going into Tampa now for Game 3 that the Leafs should employ that? Uh, strategy of letting Tampa come to them, or they should be coming right out of the gate to b- apply pressure in their own barn. It's going to be a definitely a different atmosphere for sure, even though it's still going to be blue and white, and there may be a significant amount of Leaf fans still. But we're we're going into their barn. Do you think it should be let it come to us or go at them, Craig? Well, because it's they're not at home, they're not going to be able to get the the matchup play that they did in the first two games. So just by doing that, you need to play a little bit more of a defensive side because you're not going to be able to get the optimal matchups. So as long as you can play a defensive game, keep Tampa to the outside. As soon as that puck comes toward the net, that's where the Leafs, they just fall apart. Yeah. Um, but if they, they really have been really good at keeping the puck to the outside, keeping the guys away from the front of the net, especially since Labushkin and Brody have come in, or um, Gio have come in, they've been really good at that. If they can maintain that, I think that they they can shut Tampa down and get their opportunities, especially in an away game. Dan, anything else to add on what to look out for as the visiting team in Tampa? Well, I, I think Craig's right. that I mean, I think if they have to go in with a certain amount of uh, assertion and physicality, but I'm also really worried about Tampa's size and the amount of um, physical strength they have on their team. Like, I was looking at stats earlier today, and their bottom six of their offense is phenomenal in hits. And then you look at their defense, and you've got Hedman, McDonough, who else have you got? Uh, yeah, anyway, but like you've got... Sergachev, oh, yeah. Sergachev, yeah, Sergachev, Chernak. And then you've got yeah. Stamkos, who's not afraid to hit either, and Kucherov, who's not afraid to hit. So like the whole team is coming after you. So I'm a little worried if the Leafs go full-on aggressive, they might go a little too far and get back into that scrambly play so i would want to see kind of a um conservative approach but leaning toward more assertion personally i love to see when the other team has a whole bunch of hits on their line because it means they never have the puck well that's fair too it's true if you hit it's true but if you never have the puck you're going to get some hits which means that's where you can try to get your top line out there just on an odd change and that's where you're going to score some goals. And that's where the Leafs have done it. They've been really good at getting those matchups. They were at home. But Keefe has been coaching pretty well, I would say, so far in this series in terms of matchups and getting Austin Matthews out there. Sometimes he's out there with some fourth-line guys. He'll just throw them out there because Austin Matthews can score at any time because he can make those plays. And our fourth-line guys have almost all played with him as well at one point or another. So they, mm-hmm. they have experience with them, which has been really good throughout the season. Line blundering, trying some stuff. Craig with the segue again. You got it, man. You got these. <laughs> <laughs> line predictions. Last thing for this podcast. What do we think the line predictions are? I'd say defense is pretty set. I don't think we need yeah, to yeah. go over that. They've been pretty solid overall. We mentioned maybe a little bit too much jumping up. They can figure that out on their own. The forwards. First line. We've seen two iterations. Now, Bunting wasn't in the first game. However, Kerfoot was really good on the top line. So do you think game three, they go Matthews, Marner, Bunting, or Matthews, Marner, Kerfoot? Quick question, Dan, yes or no? I'm, I'm going to go Bunting. Uh, he earned his place back. He got the first goal. I would stick with him. I realize I gave you two options and then said yes or no. Yeah, but I knew what you meant, buddy. <laughs> Craig. I think... I, I think there's just so much chemistry with Bunting that you have to keep him up there. Um, I, I would keep I would put Kerfoot with Tavares just to try to get a little bit more energy on that line. Cool. Second line. Tavares, Mikheyev have been pretty consistent recently, and then maybe a little bit of rotating with that third. Kerfoot was there in last game. 
Kasha was their first game, and man, did he have a good game. His first game back in like 20 games after his concussion. I would say maybe a little gun-shy in the physicality, which is fine and fair. And man, he, he put up the points. He was digging for pucks and stuff. So who do you prefer on that line? Uh, Craig, some Kerfoot, some Kasha, maybe Mikheyev moves. What do you think? I think I would keep Mikheyev on that top line just because I don't know where else I would put him. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't mess with the third line, so I'd leave him up there. Kasha or Kerfoot on the other side, I think it's kind of a toss-up. I think you just go with whoever is kind of feeling hot at that moment. You can throw up on that top line. Even if it's Kasha to start and Kerfoot's having a better game, to throw Kerfoot up there instead. I, well, let's try Kasha. I mean, reignite the Tavares line, give uh, Tavares a bit more of uh, uh, speed to play with, I guess. Uh, well, I mean, Kerfoot's pretty fast. <laughs> it's a tough call. But yeah, I'd throw him up there, Kasha up there, and uh, see what he can do. And I don't then think- again, I... Sorry, then again, I actually wouldn't feel bad about putting Kasha on the third line and moving Nylander up back up to the second line. Ooh, that would be interesting, too. More blundering. Engvel, Conf, Kasha would still be a really good third line. But Nylander and they on work. the right. We know Conf and Kasha work really well together. Yep. Okay, I like it. I like it. I like it. So, third line, those two options there. Obviously, we have uh, Conf, Engvel, and uh, who the heck is the third person? Nylander. Oh, yeah, Nylander, yeah. right? I always think that he's on... I, I just automatically put him on the second line. But, yeah, Nylander. And uh, potentially, like I just said, put him up. Kerfoot comes down. Maybe even Kasha's there. Lots and lots of line combinations with that one. We talked about a couple. Fourth line. This is the one where we can change things up. We talked about it a little bit at the beginning. We could have Blackwell, Simmons, and Clifford. We could have Blackwell, Simmons, and either Kasha or Kerfoot. We could have Blackwell Kerfoot, uh, sorry, Blackwell Clifford, and one of those two guys. Or does Spezza potentially come in in some capacity on this fourth line? Daniel, best fourth line for game three. So I'm going to change my answer. I was pro Simmons. Now I'm going to go Clifford for a few reasons. Uh, one, he's still tough. Like we need toughness on that line, of course. And Clifford is still tough. But then also you've got the youth and speed that Clifford has. And I think resting Simmons for uh, maybe a tough game four or five is not a bad idea. So I would uh, bring Clifford back in. But not Spezza? I was thinking about it, but I, I think he's maybe like, uh, oh shit, we're down 3-1 in the series. We need to bring out somebody that knows what they're doing. But I don't know. I mean, Tampa's a fast team. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to wear him out too soon. Craig, thoughts on the fourth? Well, I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I think Spezza is a game five kind of guy. When they're back in Toronto, they can get the matchups. When you need to try to, like I was saying, lock down or salvage the series, that's when you're going to want Jason Spezza. I really do like the line of uh, Clifford, Blackwell, and Simmons. That has worked pretty well. But I know with uh, Bunting coming back, I think... Right now, I think I would take out um, Simmons and have Kerfoot on that third on that fourth line with the way that everything has kind of shaked out right now. Let's pretend your fourth line has to be Blackwell, Simmons, and Clifford. Who comes out? That's the problem. I don't think there's anyone else in the top nine that I would take out of the lineup at this point. Gun to your head. Kasha, only because of the chance of him getting injured for the next game. Okay. Dan? Uh, Yeah, I mean, (laughs) that's a really tough call. He's missed a lot of games. That's the only reason. I agree, Kasha, just for go with who we've been playing with. Okay. I know Engvall's been good, but I think Engvall might be the first guy to go. Or even Blackwell. Like, I know I said they have to be that, but maybe Engvall goes fourth line center. Yeah, possibly. I think he's been too good on that third line to move him down. Okay. Okay. I okay. think Blackwell, maybe, but he does bring something else that, you know, not a lot, not too many other guys on the team has. He kind of yeah, has like that, Blackwell. that Kerfoot mm-hmm. kind of feeling to him where mm-hmm. he's not a big guy, but he has a lot of energy and he doesn't, he's not afraid to get in somebody's face. I think that'll be the most interesting thing uh, tomorrow at practice to come in on Twitter, like what the lineups might be. Mm-hmm. 
and then obviously game time decisions and stuff too. That'll be really, really, really interesting to see if they try to shake it up or if they go with what they know to uh, combat Tampa for game three. I don't think it's terrible to go down 2 1, but it'd be a lot better to go up 2 1. That's for oh, sure. Yeah. Put some pressure on, and maybe go up 3 1 going back. Like the Leafs can do yeah. it. Yeah. We know they can win on the road. They had a great road season this year. I agree. I agree. First half. Let's do it. Just do it. Like, what are you guys doing? Just do it. Nike. There you go. (laughs) Okay. Thank you very much for listening to Leafs fans in hostile lands. I might have been on the radio before you heard this. CBC called us up again. Uh, Was hoping to be on uh, 8, 10-ish Friday morning. So if you're listening to this, go back to CBC on uh, the interwebs and see if you can can listen to it. Maybe, Maybe I swore on the radio. I'm pro- I'm gonna try. <laughs> That's exciting. I'm gonna. Can you imagine? No, oh, I'm not doing it. Talking about Austin fucking Matthews. That That's fucking right. Fucking Matthews is so. Oh, sorry. Oh my god. Wow. Wow. And if you're a first See? time listener from the uh, listening from the morning show, thank you for listening. This is awesome. Because it's late. Let's get the fuck out of here. It is late. Let's go to bed. <laughs> Let's go to bed. Everyone, go see Doctor Strange. It was maddening. It was madness. It was multiversey. Go, let go. <laughs> Go Leafs go. Go Leafs go. <laughs> we, we like to have fun here. This is good times.